let Michaela show her screen. No, we don't need the dual screen. Michaela uh, is the only one presenting. Yep, yep. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. All right. We're waiting for the YouTube to turn on. Okay. Somehow I hear some echo. Okay, all right, I guess we're live. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to session four of EGPGV. Uh, technical difficulty for me. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, it is with great pleasure. Wow, I'm still hearing echo. I, I don't know what's going on. Okay, everybody's muted, I hope. Okay, all right, we can go now. <laughs> all right, so it is with my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Michaela Toffer as the keynote speaker of EGPGV. And uh, Dr. Michaela Toffer is an ACM distinguished scientist and holds the Jack Dangara Professorship in High Performance Computing at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Padova, Italy, and her doctoral degree from ETH. Uh, she postdoc at the University of California, San Diego, and the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, her keynote talk is about her new project under the Big Data Program of the U.S. National Science Foundation. The title of her keynote speech is In Situ Data Analytics and Next Generation Molecular Dynamics Workflows. Also, as an innovation enabled by this new format of online virtual conference, Michaela invited three of her co-PIs to join the Q&A section of the keynote presentation. Um, the co-presenters are uh, Dr. Michelle Kwende of Lausanne University Hospital, Dr. Chelsea Estrada of University of New Mexico, and Dr. Harold Weinstein of Whale Cornell Medical College of Cornell University. So now let's welcome Dr. Michaela Taufer. Thank you, thank you, Jean. And it's quite a pleasure to be here and speak with you all. Uh, and I'm particularly thrilled because it doesn't happen every day that I can present and engage in a discussion with uh, uh, the community together with uh, my collaborators, uh, Mitchell, Trilse, and RL. Uh, and, oh, struggling with my. Uh, Mouse. So before to start uh, my talk, I uh, I want to thank all the people that has been working with us on this project, uh, student, postdoctoral researcher, uh, the are listed here, and our sponsors, the National Science Foundation and IBM. And you see here the uh, investigator of this project, Tilse uh, Harel. Uh, Mitchell and Eva Dilma, who is not here with us today. We don't see so, it's 
problem to see my slides? Oops, I've been told that there is some problem to see my slides. Um, can I confirm that my slides are visible? Uh, or I try to share again. Oh, this is the nice part of uh, presenting live. Okay, perhaps my screen went lost in the process of moving from one interface to another. So I start again and I share my slides and it should be visible. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Fantastic, excellent. Thank you so much. So indeed, thank you uh, to all the collaborators uh, and uh, co-worker that has been participating in what I'm presenting today. Uh, as I said, uh, it doesn't happen every day that I have the opportunity to engage in a discussion with the community and my collaborators. Today is the first time and I'm very thrilled. I want to start this presentation by looking a little bit at a couple of trends in our community and start with the trend in workflow. Uh, traditionally, workflow has been compute intensive, but as we look around and we see important workflow like this one in the slides, which is the uh, legal uh, workflow, we see that they are becoming a combination of compute, analytic, and data. So workflows are becoming more and more complex and data and the analytic of this data is becoming an integral part of uh, the uh, scientific discovery. What happens in HPC at the same time? Well, uh, here there are two pictures and I want to present both uh, one at a time. The first one is on your left and it's showing the trend in terms of uh, uh, system peaks, computing power, and uh, in terms of IO bandwidth for the uh, three top supercomputers in the past uh, 10 years in the US, Jaguar, Titan, and Summit. And we look at the trends that characterize this supercomputer, we see that uh, they're becoming more and more powerful from the point of view of the computing. The peak flops are growing substantially. But what we are not absorbing is a parallel grow in terms of IO bandwidth. And there is some uh, uh, constraints that force us to keep the IO bandwidth, power constraints that force us to keep the bandwidth low. Uh, but that is an important gap that we have to consider because what brings this uh, gap is a generation of more and more data uh, through computation and simulation that have a bottleneck when it is time to move them down to the parallel system and storage. On your right, you have a different type of picture in which we looked at uh, uh, the jobs, the type of jobs that are executed on supercomputers at the Lawrence Livermore National uh, Laboratory. And here you see that uh, as we move from 2005 to 2018, from Purple to Sierra, the number of uh, when users submit their simulation, their application, uh, they don't submit any longer very few compute intensive job, but the type of job they submit become many, many jobs, perhaps shorter, and they sort of create this ensemble of jobs per user. So what does it mean here is that we have more data generated that have to be moved to a slower storage or in a slower way to storage. And on the other hand, we have uh, more local data generated through ensembles that need to be considered for a global knowledge. So if we look at how we are analyzing this data uh, traditionally today, we see that normally we run simulations and these are simulation on our supercomputer. Uh, and after the simulation take place, we normally move the data to dedicated machines where we perform the analysis a posteriori when the simulation is over. So with the change, that we are observing with this trend in which the IO bandwidth is becoming a bottleneck, we have to have an additional challenge for the scientists, which is the movement of the data from the uh, node, from the computing node to the parallel file system 
is a new bottleneck that result in slowdown of the simulation. We don't realize, we don't see it, but effectively we are achieving less science over time because the job itself is slowed down, waiting to write to the parallel system. Now, once this analysis takes place, the scientists learn about the work that has been performed, learn about information about the simulation, and normally tend to go back and resubmit from scratch new simulation. So there are three potential bottlenecks not only transferring the data from the parallel file system to local machine for the analytic, but then we have to face the aspect of moving the data from the compute node to the parallel file system. And last but not least, we need to learn from this analysis and start new simulations from scratch. So what is the future? Well, what do we wish to have to address these three major bottlenecks? Well, we want to run the simulation. We want to explore our uh, application discovery, but we want to do that while at the same time we are analyzing what the simulation generates. And that means that we are learning as we are running simulations and we can inject this knowledge, what we are learning, to steer our simulations. And so what we present here is the need for in situ analyzing and runtime steering, which means that as we are running our simulations in situ or in transit, uh, so in situ is on your left, uh, in transit or your right, we share resources, we share nodes on which we compute the traditional simulation and the analytic, and or we dedicate node for the simulation and other for the analytic, but with a certain proximity so that uh, the network interconnect doesn't become a bottleneck. And this is an important uh, view of how to execute simulation with in situ analytics. So the key question is, do we have the tool, do we have software tool that allow us to perform that? And there are a library that has been developed, one of which is the data spaces library, and that provide this support or initial support for in situ and in transit analytics. So what are the applications that need the most support when it is time to run um, in situ analytic? So I went back and look at the past six months uh, on an important set of resources that are supported by uh, NSF. These are called the Exceed uh, resources. It's a set of supercomputer distributed across the United States. And I survey what are the scientific fields that are predominantly using these infrastructures. And what we see here that is the majority of the fields are in the uh, area of uh, biomolecular sciences. Uh, so if we look back at the past uh, many, many years, we can see that this community the biomolecular sciences uh, that group together multiple uh, venues, multiple groups, multiple community. They have been uh, very good in developing a robust computational software ecosystem. So as they look across scale, from quantum scale to atomic scale, up to the macro scale, they have been able to develop robust software that is compute intensive for the study of this phenomena on our supercomputers. And one of this field, one of this uh, software component is what we call under the common umbrella of molecular dynamic simulation that allow us to study uh, the atomic uh, representation and interaction in a molecular structure. So it is this type of simulation that we are targeting this project. They are uh, very uh, well known, strong, uh, representative across uh, biomolecular sciences. Uh, they are uh, very uh, efficient when run on supercomputers. Let's look at them from the computational point of view and then see how 
this type of simulation can benefit from in situ analytic, which is what we want to pursue. So we speak about the classical molecular dynamic simulations. It is a uh, show the time uh, evolution of molecules uh, across the time. We look at aspect of uh, uh, changes of conformation, so structural changes of the molecule. And what we have is an ensemble of jobs. So a molecular dynamic simulation is not one single job, but is an ensemble of jobs. So we go back to the fact that we are observing this transition from sing few jobs to many, many jobs, ensemble of jobs, and the molecular dynamic simulation are a representative of this type of jobs. So a molecular dynamic simulation, so Hi, it's Michaela, not we're one. hearing some echo. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Do you happen to have your YouTube on? Uh, I don't actually. Okay, uh, I right. have closed all my... Uh... Actually, the echo is gone. So. Okay. Okay. I'll mute. Uh, okay. Thank you. So um, that new technology for us, we get used. I think it's uh, quite amazing. We can reach out to so many people from our living room or our office at home. Uh, so the molecular dynamic simulation we, that we are targeting uh, can be envisioned as a representative of ensemble uh, simulation. And what we have here is a little bit of description of what does it mean running a molecular dynamic simulation. It means that we are running hundreds of thousands of jobs, and each job uh, is in reality uh, a, a evolution of uh, a molecular structure from a string of amino acids to a structural conformation that have a uh, bio. Uh, a biology or a physics uh, impact on our research. So what we have is that this job perform hundreds of thousands of iteration. And what you're seeing here is an example of ensemble in which we start from a string of amino acid and we move through multiple jobs that can be forked or terminated during this path uh, that move towards what is a folding of a protein. Uh, so as we move across this job and as we move across a step of iteration through this job, what we are doing is uh, updating the position of the atoms, updating the position of the atom in this molecular structure, which means that we start by computing the forces of single atoms, and then we use these forces to compute the acceleration of the atoms. The accelerators allow us to update the velocity, and the velocity allow us to update the position of the atoms. And we repeat this one iteratively uh, for many, many steps. And at the end of a certain number of steps, what we call the strides, we uh, put in output for the scientist a snapshot of the atoms at that time. And here is where we generate data, where we generate new frames. And so the point is here that as our machine becomes faster and faster, not only we can generate longer and longer trajectory, but we can also sample the snapshot of our molecular structure as evolve in time more frequently. And so here is where we generate more data that we would like to analyze at runtime. And what kind of analysis do we want to do on these frames? Well, uh, there are different analyses. The type of analysis we are looking at is what we call capturing rare events. What is a rare event? Is a transformation, for example. And so here you have an example of transformation in which we have beta sheets uh, in this case, and I see if I can use my mouse to show that, these beta sheets that are transformed through the molecular dynamic simulation into alpha helix. Uh, other example of uh, transformation or rare event are rotations or movements. And so in this case, for example, you see that this alpha helix uh, is moving and rotating substantially during the simulation. How do we traditionally look at this trajectory? How do we look and we learn what is going on and what is the status uh, within a simulation or within a trajectory? Well, we normally use visualization. It's been a powerful tool for us in which the scientists, after submitting the job, uh, look 
uh, and after executing the simulation, go back, retrieve the data, and look through the snapshots to the frame. So in this case, you have, for example, a string of amino acids that fold into an alpha helix. Uh, and so the scientists look at this evolution and identified when the uh, frame, when the uh, alpha helix is stable. Well, if we want to learn as the simulation evolves, we need to change the uh, perspective from the scientist to the analytic at runtime. And that means that we can no longer stop the simulation to look at the status of uh, the simulation at runtime. We don't want also to move frames. So consider about the frequency of these frames, the size of the frames, moving them from the distributed nodes to a centralized node can create an additional bottleneck. And the other part that is even more challenging is the point in which we say now, for example, we have a stable alpha helix, like in this case, is it something that requires a comparison between frame? This is something that means that we need to keep data in memory, frame in memory that can become very large, and we need to compare them to each other, or we need to compare them with other frames in other jobs. These are all aspects that slow down the simulation and slow down the scientific discovery. And so these are all conditions we would like to avoid when we define in situ analytics for our molecular dynamics simulation. So, you may think that, yeah, we have a solution, which is the molecular, the machine learning codes. We speak a lot, we use a lot of machine learning codes to extrapolate knowledge from our simulation. But there is a myth behind the ma machine learning codes. They are not the solution to our challenge. They are just a small part of a bigger solution. And the bigger solution is a data software ecosystem that we are in need today for molecular dynamics in our case, and in a broader sense for uh, data intensive uh, applications. And this data software ecosystem is still missing. It's a challenge that uh, needs to be addressed and we are trying to address in this project for molecular dynamics simulation. This picture, come from a paper that I have studied here. And I sort of embrace this vision that uh, the data software ecosystem is not only machine uh, learning code, but require a development of a larger uh, combination of tools and software components that work in concert. And uh, so do we have it? I'm saying it is missing. Based on what do I, I reach this conclusion? Well, I went back to the exceed resource usage that we can access uh, through the portal of this fantastic initiative. And I look at what kind of category of application we are running. And what I saw is that today we are using exclusively our exceed resources for what we call high performance computing, which is synonymous of compute intensive application. So as I am running more and more simulations, where do I put this data? Because somehow these simulations are generating data. And where, how do I analyze them? Perhaps we are indeed missing uh, the software ecosystem, because what I would expect is a balance between compute and analytic. And this is clear and imbalanced. So in the rest of my talk, I want to address a couple of aspects that are the one in the box that have a bold black uh, frame that address the aspect of data collection, feature extraction, process, uh, management tools and analytics tool for the molecular dynamic simulation. Of course, I let other in the community the challenge to look at similar problem for other type of simulation. So let's go, let's go back to our 
application, our simulation, and look at a trajectory, which is a job, a molecular dynamic job that is evolving like this very simple one. And so far, we have said the scientist and the visualization tool are a key part of understanding what is going on in our simulation. But what if, as I am evolving through my simulation, I am able to capture aspect of my single frame locally that represent, become metadata for what is going on in the frame. And indeed, we call this metadata collected variables. Collected variables are variables that capture the structure or the movement of the uh, structural component of the molecule. And so as I move forward and I generate one frame at the time, for that frame, I uh, generate an, uh, in concert a, a set of collective variables. And as I move forward, I sort of forget the previous frames. And for the new frame, I compute collected variables. And so as the simulation evolves, I end up having uh, the frames that I can uh, archive, I can uh, discharge, and at the same time, I have a set of effective and uh, concise collective variables. And so the idea is, can I use these collected variables as proxy for the structural and conformational changes without me keeping the frame in memory and comparing these frames? Can I compare and can I collect collective variables? And what does allow me to create this set of collective variables? Well, uh, we need to implement what we call a closed loop data flow. And we need to create this data flow with in mind the fact that we don't want to rewrite software. We don't want to change the software. We want to combine software packages. And so we start with the molecular dynamic codes that exist are very good. So we speak about Gromix, Umber, Charm, and many, many more. Uh, and we don't want to rewrite them, but we want to preserve them and plug in, leverage a software like Plum that plug in and capture frame as they are generated. And these frames, uh, as they are generated, are moved to data storage, but we don't go to the parallel file system. We keep them in memory. So we have staging area where we keep our frame for the analytic, for the time of the analytic. And we leverage, again, existing software, which is the data spaces in situ analytic software. When these frames are available, as they are available, we plug in uh, a analytic modules that uh, generate collected variables and that indeed leverage machine learning code. But, uh, but the machine learning code is only one aspect of the entire big picture. And ideally, what we want to do is learn from this collected variable because we want to give feedback to the molecular dynamic simulation. So something I want to point out here, and I will probably rephrase that and uh, uh, repeat in the next slides, is how we are not rewriting existing software. It's an important principle of our collaboration. We want to leverage what is available to the scientists by creating uh, APIs that allow to plug in multiple existing softwares and by uh, plugging them together, let them work uh, in concert to create this closed loop data flow. I want to focus into the part of the data analytics because there, there is a lot of uh, uh, contributions that are needed and also some creativity that is needed when it is about transforming a frame into a collected variable that can capture aspect of the structure of our uh, molecular um, systems. So if we look at our proteins, which are our main <laughs> simulation object, object are represented we have different type of representations. 
And so uh, we go from a three-dimensional Cartesian to a multifold to a surface representation. But none of these representations are ideal for aspect of uh, uh, identification of substructures, identification of changes inside the structure. Uh, if we want to do that without a zoom in visualization approach that is driven by the scientists. What if we have the possibility to transform a protein a conformation, a frame, into something that has a graphic encoding, a graphic representation, a sort of very uh, interesting picture, image. What if we can transform this into a two-dimensional uh, image and we embed into this image information about the structure of the protein? Well, this is exactly the process that our group has followed. And here I want to present uh, in detail this algorithm, which has been led by Trilse and our group. And so this idea is, let's start with a three-dimensional frame of a protein. Uh, it's a snapshot. And let's transform it. So our starting point is uh, indeed this uh, multifold representation. Our end point is a uh, image-like representation of the protein. And how do we go uh, from the starting point to a point that become then suitable, for example, for neural network, for learning in neural network? Well, uh, it's a process that goes through uh, understanding of the science and the uh, space in which the protein uh, conformation Yes. So as you see here, we have four distinct processes or steps. The first one is based on the Ramachandra plot. And the Ramachandra plot allow us to associate the amino acid of a protein to uh, specific secondary structures that are uh, well known, like alpha helix, beta strands. And then there is a subset that uh, it's, we call other, the predominant component are alpha helix and beta strands. Uh, and so the Ramachandra plot leverage uh, uh, dihedral uh, angles to tell us, OK, this amino acid is part of an alpha helix. This amino acid is part of a beta strand. And or this amino acid is a coil. The second step is once we have identified what is the structure, the secondary structure in which the amino acid is part, is to understand how these secondary structure interact to each other by establishing a correlation between the different secondary structure through what we call a distance matrix. Now, we are not looking at the complex process of computing atom to atom distance. We perform a simplification of the secondary structure. We use what is the common uh, alpha carbon atom in each amino acid as a uh, representative for that amino acid. And we build distance matrices that represent indeed the correlation and the distances in the space for the secondary structures. The third step is about uh, combining the secondary structure and their correlation in the space, which is also called tertiary structure, in a way that capture uh, the type of uh, structure and their distance into three different channels. It's what you see this channel encoding. And so we have three channels, each one embedding inside uh, the relationship between the first one is beta uh, strand and alpha helix. Uh, the second one look at aspect of beta strand and other infra uh, secondary structure. The last one is about alpha helix and other uh, secondary structure. And where uh, we need to pay attention here is that we are combining the information of what structure and what is the distance in terms of colors and intensity of these colors. So uh, the combination of these three channels result in a final encoding uh, that uh, is a uh, n by n by three uh, 
tensor. Uh, the process has been very simplified in this very short couple of minutes. I invite you, uh, if you want to learn more about this uh, process that seems complex, but is quite logical and straightforward by uh, accessing this paper that is reported in this slide. Point is that when we look at our trajectories, our trajectories are no longer a representation that you can think of snapshots like you have here on your left, but become a sequence of images that are similar to the one that you see on your right. And let me show you an example of encoding. Uh, this is an MCH uh, heavy chain, is uh, part of uh, proteins that are important for our immune system and has multiple uh, as components, substructure or secondary structure that are relevant. See the alpha uh, structure um, and the beta structures. And so let me show you how the three channels look like for the snapshot that you are seeing here on your right on the corner, top corner. So here you see that we have created through this process three channels. Uh, presenting indeed the interaction between alpha, uh, helix, and beta strands, uh, beta strands and others conformation, and last but not least, alpha, helix, and others. And if we combine them together in what we say is a graphical representation, this is the encoding image that is matching uh, the uh, traditional representation of the protein. And inside this image, we see that there are uh, sub uh, regions that encapsulate and capture information for the specific uh, substructure, secondary structures, the A1, A2, B1, B2, represent respectively set of alpha helix and beta strands. So when it is time to look at this specific secondary structure and how they interact with each other, we can focus on this subset. And so let me show you an example of how we can detect conformational changes in trajectory through these images. This is a different protein. This is an Obscene, it's uh, important it's part, it can be found in our retina, is uh, part of the process of being light sensitive and detection of light. Uh, and what we have here is a relatively um, large protein, uh, and we use our graphical representation uh, to identify those areas of the protein that have, are going through particular conformational changes. So here you have a big uh, representation of the entire protein, but then we zoom in to uh, a loop, which is the TM5 and TM6. And as you see, it has a specific subregion of this image. And if we look, at what happens as the simulation evolves, like in this case, you have three snapshots at different time in which we are looking at how our protein has been uh, changing, and in particular, how the uh, TM6 part of the loop is uh, unraveling. Unraveling. And what we see is that that is matched with transformation into our images. So, uh, besides capturing the changes into a trajectory, our representation is able also to address aspect of high throughput in protein analysis. So uh, we go back to the fact that protein as they are represented in traditional way are difficult to compare, but at the same time we know that uh, protein with similar structure may have similar functions. And so we want to understand when we develop synthetic proteins uh, or when we uh, implement protein through simulations, whether that type of protein has specific uh, functionality or may have specific functionality by having uh, specific substructure that are similar. And so you see the difficulties of comparing these proteins, it's quite, uh, significant. If we do that visually, it slows down quite a lot of our work. But what if we represent these proteins through images, like the one that uh, is resulting for our process? And if we consider this, if we have a large number of proteins, uh, 
that have unknown functionality. Can we use these images and feed them into a convolutional neural network and identify, classify this protein based on their substructures? And it is what we have done in this uh, test. Uh, we have taken almost 63,000 protein from the PDB uh, data set, and we have tried to cluster them without knowing a priori what is their group, uh, into eight biological groups. Uh, it's, we are looking at a taxonomy that is well known, uh, and it is present in the PDB data set. We have for a moment forgotten what it is and tried to classify this large data set in eight groups. And so here is what we normally use for a comparison is a normalized confusion matrix. The ground truth is uh, uh, the groups that the PDB associate to the proteins. The predictions uh, is what our convolutional neural network uh, tell us the protein belongs to. And as you see, it's quite a high uh, accuracy, in average, we have 88% with some protein that are easier to identify uh, in their correct group than other. But uh, it's quite remarkable how indeed these images can capture features of the uh, protein structure. So I want to go back to where I started when I was speaking about uh, molecular dynamics simulations, and I told you that is an ensemble of jobs. And so far, what I have shown you is how to move uh, forward and analyze in situ a single trajectory, a single job that is evolving and in its evolution is changing the structure of a molecule that we are simulating. But we need to look at the entire ensemble because the molecular dynamic knowledge comes from the observation of the ensemble. And so if this is the picture that I show you uh, at the beginning of my talk in which we were looking at aspect of uh, uh, using existing code, uh, developing uh, APIs that plug in in the existing software for a SQL trajectory, where we want to be is a more general vision in which we have multiple jobs, not just one, in which we have many type of uh, analytics, many different representation and algorithm for the scope of uh, scientific discovery. Uh, it could be understanding and annotating dynamics in trajectory, uh, uh, enabling adaptive sampling. Ultimately, what we want to do is enabling on the fly tuning of our molecular dynamics. So having aspect of stopping, starting, forking jobs because um, what is going on in that job uh, is interesting or not interesting and so uh, require further study without going to the end of the simulation but as the simulation evolves and another important thing i want to point out is that we don't want to rewrite from scratch existing software that is indeed robust and has quite a lot of potential, but we need to plug them together then. So as a matter of fact, if we're going to go from a single node in situ analytic to many nodes, then we need to look beyond the data spaces. And right now we are looking at the uh, UCX, uh, this unified communication X uh, uh, tool that allow us to go beyond the single node and look at larger ensemble. So I want to uh, close this talk by looking at a couple of molecular system of interest that uh, currently uh, our collaborators at the Whale Cornell um, Medical College, so uh, Dr. Weinstein and Dr. Quelter are looking at, and I'm thrilled they are here because they can also elaborate a little bit more beyond the computer science, the relevance of this. One is the human uh, dopamine transporter for which we are trying to understand the dynamic at runtime. The other one is the uh, uh, bovine beta lactoglobin uh, for which we are trying to understand the docking process. So there is a open and closed loop 
uh, that characterize success or unsuccess of docking in this protein. So these are two of the many uh, molecular system of interest that we can we hope to be able to speed in their understanding through the workflows that I presented here today. So to end my talk and then start an interesting, hopefully interesting discussion with the attendees, I want to point out how we need to move uh, forwards the development of what I call a uh, data uh, software ecosystem. And that means, uh, well, we looked at that from the molecular dynamic workflow point of view, but it's by uh, no means the only type of workflow that needs this kind of support. Uh, from our point of view, uh, we think it's very important that we continue to develop new in situ method to trace the molecular events, understand what is going on as the simulation evolves. And I hope I gave you this sense that it's not just an algorithmic issue, that it comes, the success of this kind of methods is based on the collaboration between the scientists and the computer scientists. And then this new data representation that we are presenting here and together with other data, uh, that other data representation, it's vital for the use, the proper and effective use of uh, machine learning techniques, which, by the way, are only one part of the big picture for scientific discovery. And uh, if we want to create something that is reusable, portable, we don't want to reinvent the wheel but we want to build around existing software, uh, plug in the existing software in a way that the workflow manager can integrate them and leverage them for runtime uh, detection of rare event, uh, runtime detection of convergences of simulation, uh, and uh, other many other scientific discovery. Uh, supported by molecular dynamics. I am here and I am very pleased to uh, answer your question together with my collaborators today uh, in this session. Thank you. All right, thank you, Michaela. This really exciting talk. All right, so let's give the audience a little bit of time to see if they have a question. All right. Okay, so before they put in a question, let me start with one. So uh, quite often in situ uh, has been communicated as, you know, we need to do it because IO is now a barrier. Uh, you guys didn't come from that angle. You were trying to enable some new signs, right? So to search for complex rare events. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, system building, a lot of uh, algorithm design, but how did you even just come up with a project like this? You know who just uh, who drove the process? What was your thought process on, uh, on that front? Well, I, I would like to engage also my collaborators and, and have also their, their uh, point of view. I think that there is something that we have in common on this team, which understand how computing is becoming cheaper and cheaper in terms of accessibility, in terms of efficiency with the event of accelerators, for example. And somehow this data, uh, embed so much knowledge that seems that we, we may lose otherwise. Uh, and, and that was the sort of urgency that, from my point of view, uh, needed to be addressed. And perhaps I would like to see what also my collaborators think about that. Yeah, hi, everyone. Maybe I can say a, a word here. Um, so yeah, I, I think the idea from for this project really uh, came at the confluence of two points of view. The, the first one is the computer science point of view, which uh, Michaela alluded to in her introduction, seeing the specs of the future uh, very large uh, high performance uh, clusters. Uh, you, you, you really notice that there is this decoupling between this, the, the speed at which uh, computing power increases and the speed at which storage and, and bandwidth to storage increase. And, and there we see that for our applications, we will run into problems. But down there is also the practitioner's point of view, because already now the way we do uh, run and 
analyze molecular dynamics simulations has changed. Um, you know, when when I started uh, in this field, we would run one simulation, then we would uh, just look at it uh, as a movie in a three-dimensional visualization software and, and, and basically look at it and see what was happening. And already now, this is not possible anymore. Uh, we have to script and automate the analysis and we have to move around huge amounts of data so we can we start to see the limits uh, of that and uh, we, we we recognize the need for new tools to 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 do these tasks uh, and I would add that um, from our from the perspective of the practitioner um, I can say that the molecular dynamics field is driven by the fact that no amount of data is sufficient. And that is because, um, not because of the veracity of the scientists for any kind of information, but by definition of what molecular dynamics is trying to achieve, namely the behavior of larger and larger systems in under conditions that are um, become relevant only at very um, um, extended times of simulation so that you can sample an increasingly complex space. The, the extraordinary amount of data it can, is only going to grow because it is impossible to get the information that one needs about a complex system without accumulating these enormous amounts of data. On the other hand, there are in this enormous amount of data, very clear questions that are known even before the data are analyzed, because in many cases, the MD simulations are done not in order to see what happens, but in order to see how certain behaviors are expressed in these complex systems which means that in many cases, you know that you're looking for certain things, but you can't find them in this enormous amount of data. So the idea of looking for them while the data evolves seems entirely natural. It is not an, an, a posteriori um, idea of, oh, well, you know, if I, if I could, if I could compact the data, if I decrease the dimensionality, I would be able to bring it to my machine or easier and then see it. But rather the fact that you want to know as you explore the space in which these atoms move and create the complex form of the molecules, whether you have achieved certain properties that are of importance. And so this is in principle something that if it happens simultaneously you have gained a lot already in the game so when the possibility arose and in our case it was from a years ago simulation with me, um, a conversation with michaela when the when the possibility arose that this is something that we can actually try to achieve that became sort of a natural quest for going in that direction. But I can tell you that one of the complicated components of this is the mutual education of, of the computer scientists and the artificial intelligence experts, uh, all of which are represented in our group, and the people, the biophysicists, who actually have this uh, understanding of, the, of what it represents and what the needs are. And bringing them together is a great achievement. And I think this format of collaboration, which is really something that Michaela organized, um, is, is enormously productive and, and very exciting. I, I, I want to join you and say that problems don't come from, you don't go in and shop for problems. I think that these problems become 
uh, exciting challenges because of the interdisciplinarity of the team. Uh, we uh, put together a team of experts that complement each other. And I think that is a strength in this project, but also in many other projects that I see successfully moving forwards and delivering to community is the interdisciplinarity component. Yeah. All right, next question. So this is from the YouTube channel. Uh, could you further comment on rare event sampling methods in your uh, work and uh, how it is integrated in the in situ processing pipeline? I guess one thing can be added is also how sure are you? And, and I would like to, to uh, engage uh, Ariel on this because uh, Ariel, your group has been doing a lot of work on sampling and the search. Uh, here uh, from the point of view of the need for sampling and i would like to engage trills in this answer to see how machine learning uh, can uh, help us with a different way to sample uh, than the traditional random sampling or other techniques that are more statistic well human slash statistical based so I'll, I'll just make a definition and then I really would like uh, Trilsa to, uh, to comment on this because um, the expertise for machine learning uh, lies there. Um, I, I will just say that the rare events that we are looking for, as I tried to allude in, the, in, in my previous comments, uh, are, are of two kinds. One is expected rare events, and the other is unexpected rare events. The expected rare events are those that stem from the biophysics of the question, from the uh, primary reason for doing the simulation. When you understand the system, you understand that there is an expectation based on the category it comes from, based on what is known about, from experiment and function based on all kinds of things, uh, you, you have certain expectations of changes that will occur in the structure. And those are the first level or the first tier of what Michaela called in her talk, collective variables. So that going after collective variables, which you have defined a priori from the properties of the system that you're studying is a very uh, secure, because I think that was one question, how sure are you, is a very secure way for looking for rare events that have specific value, that have specific uh, knowledge value, right? And therefore are very important. But obviously, as the systems become more and more complex, the ability to identify either all of them or identify the relationship between the rare events becomes more and more complicated and you have to allow for the uh, some level of analysis that it would be again computational and obviously that's where machine learning comes in uh, for analysis of rare events that uh, you had not expected but they appear. Now for that, there are a, a series of ways which uh, we had discussed and which were proposed essentially from based on the machine learning algorithms. And I think here Trilce uh, would be able to tell you what it is that we have agreed to do now and what it is that we are continuing to do in the future. Is that okay, Trilce? Yes, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. So from the computational perspective, we have been trying a variety of things. Uh, my student, Hector Carrillo, he's been trying from, for example, autoencoders, basically teaching a model, a machine learning model, what is the normal trajectory, usually pre-trained with a few frames of the trajectory, and then let the model identify when something new comes along. And he's been using autoencoders, but we also have been using uh, decompositions, like uh, spectral decompositions and other techniques, basically just to identify when frames are not conforming to the whatever the, the simulation was seen before. 
Uh, and, and this process is still a little bit guided in terms of we need to focus in the protein uh, regions that are of relevance for our scientists, because something that we have been learning through all these years is the whole protein is involved in so many different processes that is unrealistic to focus on the protein in the complete protein. So we need to focus on, okay, what is particular regions that are going to be showing us different behavior. So that's uh, part of the work we, get, we have been doing, basically training a model with a few frames of the protein and then uh, using what is called active learning. So retraining uh, the model as we observe new frames that are of interest for us. And actually, this is part of our very new um, uh, models for, for this project that we are going to present to the group on Wednesday with uh, some exciting results, hopefully. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, so adding in one more question. So um, in situ uh, simulation, uh, well, is quite often going for speed and you guys are going for making it for, say, more effective, you know, and, and probably smarter uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. So is there a secret sauce to uh, making these simulation, in situ simulation smarter? So if someone else wants to do similar things for other applications, what should they focus on developing? Well, uh, from the software point of view, I hope that uh, we will be able to release uh, our um, APIs that allow to combine uh, the different tools that I presented here. And so the fact that right now we are not changing the software for the molecular dynamic and we are plugging in uh, sort of plug and play analytic mo uh, modules uh, embed some generality of our approach because uh, the part of what is a frame is a chunk of data. And so uh, what it's a frame is not necessarily what our colleague may be studying. So the idea is that to release our software so that other can plug in different type of simulation define the concept of chunk of data based on their type of simulation, and then leverage this idea of data spaces, UCX, analytic plug-in. Uh, and there are still components that may be, uh, have to be ad hoc, like what is the learning process, but the overall software has been uh, designed and implemented so that other type of simulation can plug in, other type of analytic can plug in. Um, th that is the part of the software workflow. Of course, the analytic, uh, our, I think one of the strengths that has been uh, extremely exciting in this project and came out from the group of Trills is this representation. Representation of data that are not intuitive to our brain, but are intuitive to machine learning. And so uh, there is a pattern in this generation of this data that may be applicable to other type of data that are simulated. Uh, it was very important for us to uh, make our idea portable and sustainable. And we think that uh, uh, some part, important part of our workflow are indeed uh, portable and sustainable. I don't know if the other uh, colleague want to add anything about that. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, I think we had from the beginning, we had in mind something that was would be very modular in the sense that, as we said before, we could change. We would not depend on a single MD molecular dynamics engine, but we could work with several different ones of the most popular ones uh, because we know practitioners in the field have all have their favorite uh, software. So they we want to continue using the same. Uh, we also don't want to be restricted to a particular type of collective variables. So the, the, the collective variables uh, in the subsequent analyses also have to be uh, um, modular in the sense that you can, you can add more bricks as, as you go. Um, and the part that does the feedback from the analytics to the simulation, we also be 
modular in the sense that the user will be able to choose uh, which uh, um, ensemble sampling method they want to, to use. Um, so this part is still uh, under development, uh, but, um, but that's the general idea. So the secret source, I don't know if there is any, but it's really this um, infrastructure that we are building between all the elements I just uh, mentioned. And um, so I, I want to point out that when we present our work, we have been presenting our work in the past, there has been some colleague who approached me and said, well, but if I embed my analysis into my code, into the molecular dynamic engine, I will be faster. And we agree, uh, but the embedding of the, of the analysis inside the software itself lose in generality, losing the possibility to change the analysis itself as the simulation and the analytic evolve. Uh, it's lose in generality if another colleague in our group want to study a different type of uh, aspect from the same type of simulations. And so uh, the sharing and the open space science was an important aspect as well. All right, we don't have much time left, so I'm going to ask uh, one more um, question here. So just to get the visualization community uh, uh, happy. So you guys are doing in situ analysis, in situ analytics. Uh, can in situ visualization help in any way? Is in situ explainable AI a thing for you guys? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that there is, and, and here I think that Trilster will be probably uh, the right person to answer. Uh, it's visualization uh, come from different point of view. We have been inspired by the visualization community, the way in which Trilce is transforming data in, so in transforming protein structure into images. And I, I like to Trilce answer that, but I think we have, we own something to the visualization community. What do you think Trilce? Yes, definitely. If you notice the way in which we prepare our encoding, uh, we could have a variety of many, many ways of uh, do it in, in other ways. So we could have been working with tensors instead of just three channels. But we chose to work with three channels to make it uh, explainable to the scientists, to be able to see what is going on with this protein as you just see that encoding. Once you are a little bit trained with that, you can see uh, loops unfolding, you can see changes of structure that are much more, or I don't know much more, but they are very, very uh, visible through our encoding. Then explainability is also a huge part for us. We, we don't want to just give them black book, black box answers to, to our colleagues. We want to be able to say why a specific, um, a specific frame is being flagged, why a specific region of the protein is being flagged. And that's still a work in progress. But in our paper, in the paper that Michaela um, cited, we have part of it for explainability, looking at the activation maps of the neural networks to see exactly what parts of the image have been um, used at specific frames in the trajectory and whether they mean something or not. So definitely that's a very, very important component of our work. I, I can also give you a, pers a biophysics perspective on this. In the end, what really matters is the puzzles that are organized in the cell, if we talk about proteins and nucleic acids in the cell. Proteins don't act separately. They only have a function because they have clumps of interactions, if you want. And this has been an enormous obstacle in creating, uh, analyzing, and understanding the behavior of these assemblies. Now, part of the questions that we ask about rare events is the transformation of a protein into something that can actually talk to another one. And then those together influence each other so that they, as a, as a duo, can, can now create a trio with some other protein and then go, say, to DNA and and um, start, um, say, gene expression. I, I apologize for all of this, uh, but you can see 
that this requires visualization for understanding, even of the data that is produced by the kinds of algorithms that, that we described, but the construction of these large uh, uh, aggregates of proteins, it, the, the major understanding for that will come from visualization and then dynamic visualization of the consequences of this formation for further interaction. So there is an, there is an enormous need for that transformation that um, uh, Trilsa was talking about and even more so into three-dimensional uh, visualizations and dynamic three-dimensional three visualizations. They're a, they're a direct consequence. Maybe if there is still a bit of time, I can also give uh, uh, my perspective on this. Um, so about visualization and interpretability of, of the predictions. Um, really, visualization has always been part of the game in the molecular dynamics uh, uh, field. Uh, I always tell um, beginners, when you run a simulation, look at the result. And that's what we always do to check that everything is fine in a simulation. Now, of course, you can't do this on a production uh, simulation on a large scale uh, system, on a large scale machine. You can't do it with your eyes anymore. But uh, I think what is really interesting is that we found a, a, an encoding a re a representation as a 2D image that is amenable to automation for analysis and monitoring of the simulation, but still is interpretable. Because when you have looked at enough of these images, you can, st you can still see what is happening a little bit in the protein. And so if the um, machine learning algorithm tells you via you know, an attention map or something like that, that here is the place where where something changed in the protein, you can, you can very quickly understand what is going on. And I think the fact that our encoding is some kind of middle ground between human interpretation and machine uh, understandable, uh, and I mean a, a representation that is understandable by a machine is, is one of the strengths of, of this representation. So um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. All right, we are one minute over time. <laughs> Thank you all so much for such a great keynote presentation. And I think the question and uh, discussion part uh, shines as much as the presentation to be able to hear about the thoughts behind all of these great results. That's truly exciting. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to um, you. Thank you to the conference organizer. Uh, thank you to the community to participating in these uh, yeah. discussions. And we look forward to keep you all updated with our yeah. progress yeah. and hopefully to share with you part of our work. All right. OK, thank you so much. Now uh, I will switch over to the best paper award presentation section. Uh, it'll be 10 minutes. I promise to be on time. Um, let me share my screen. And there I am. All right. Okay. How do you turn this on? Okay. All right. Okay. So um, it has been a great day, very busy uh, um, agenda. And uh, so we're going to present the best paper awards. And uh, first, a few uh, quick things. So this is a quick. Uh, word cloud visualization uh, of uh, all of the keywords in the accepted papers. So pull them all together. Uh, as you can see, performance is still a very big word in our field. Uh, we also see a lot of uh, optimization, um, a lot about data. Uh, reconstruction is uh, a um, big one, it's emerging feature. Of course, it is always uh, as important as uh, the, uh, the performance. Um, so uh, scenarios, uh, uh, shaders, uh, representation. Uh, so some of these do resonate very well with our keynote um, uh, presentation. Um, and then the best paper awards, uh, we're giving one best paper award and one honorable mention. 
Uh, the uh, selection is based on the reviews. Uh, so each submission has gotten four reviews. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, paper presentation and discussion uh, also uh, uh, count uh, in the selection process. Uh, and only full papers are considered for the best paper award. Uh, our best paper awards committee uh, is, uh, 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 has the list of um, uh, uh, decorated researchers. Uh, Wolf Sarsen of Chambers University of Technology, uh, Jens Kruger of University of Duisburg, Assen, uh, Marcus Hedwiger of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Um, they spend a lot of time uh, reading through the papers, uh, listening in on the presentation. So thank them for uh, uh, just a uh, lot of the contribution. Um, and then now the honorable mention. Um, funding efficient spatial distributions for massively instanced 3D models. Uh, the authors are Stefan Zellman, Nate Morico, Ingo Ward, and Valerio Pascucci. And the comments from the best paper committee uh, is that this paper is studying a very timely matter. That is when you have very complex data uh, to be able to efficiently identify uh, the hotspots and uh, the complexity. Uh, will have uh, far-reaching implications in our field. Uh, now, the best paper award approaches for in-situ comp computations of moments in a data parallel environment. Um, congratulations to the authors. Uh, the authors are Karen Tsai, Roxana Bujak, Berg Gavici, Yukarsh Ayachi, and Jim Ahrens. Um, the comments from the best paper committee is um, uh, just similar to the honorable uh, mention, this paper studies a very timely matter. Uh, in this case, it is how to identify feature uh, with generality in very large data sets. And the proposal to use moments as the method to study is showing promise. And uh, we all believe uh, it's going to have sig significant impact on our field. All right. So uh, looking forward to EGPGV 2021. Uh, so this is the part where um, it's very hard to do uh, uh, on an online uh, um, um, fashion because uh, this is where we actually want to have some dis discussion with the community. Um, so our field has been continuing on the trajectory of HPC, uh, large data set, uh, you know, leading edge science uh, for, for a while. So now with so many things happening in the field, um, and uh, there are of course a lot of um, uh, possibilities of expanding our community, uh, be it uh, to somehow reach out to and include more machine learning uh, 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 research, uh, uh, reach out to more industry, uh, reach out to more, um, say, um, application science driven uh, research, uh, so those are all possibilities. It is very hard to discuss online, so we encourage the audience to participate in the Discord EGPGB channel uh, or email us, uh, the, um, the co-chairs, as well as the uh, steering committee. Um, one thing that has worked out really well in the past three years is uh, our addition of student program chair. Uh, it is a big success, and uh, we plan on continuing that. Uh, and uh, like I said, feedback of, uh, and um, input are welcome. Uh, one thing to uh, add is this year's pandemic situation has caused significant uh, barriers in the process. Uh, there are committee members and reviewers uh, who uh, literally had to stop work because of either themselves uh, um, getting sick or you know, um, people in their um, family. Um, uh, we are very glad that we were able to make everything work in the end. Uh, hopefully, uh, this uh, um, the rendition of 2020 uh, 20 version of each PGV uh, is uh, still a valuable thing to uh, everybody. And uh, it is my personal hope that this is indeed a once in a lifetime thing. We shouldn't have to do this again. So do look forward to seeing everybody next time, not just be virtually in Norshipping, Sweden. All right, so just uh, at, as a closing, I want to uh, thank you uh, to all the authors who submitted to each PGV, and, and thank you for our committee and uh, everybody else for the service, and thank you for everybody for attending. All right, so 
let me switch to the YouTube channel uh, if I can find it. Okay, all right. So if there are any additional comments, please put that uh, in, into the channel. And uh, if there are um, no additional comments, I guess we can con conclude our event. Uh, so the Eurographics and Eurovis week uh, has many, many other events. Uh, I encourage everybody to attend as many as you can. Um, again, I want to thank our uh, keynote speakers, thank our community. Uh, this has been great. All right, we're logging off. Uh, bye, see you next year. <laughs>